Uh, I love the liveliness, the, the constant feeling of energy. Definitely the world-class education. The diversity. Nah, <laughs> the nightlife. I would say the people. For me, it's the stories. My name is Mo Waja, and welcome to Toronto Story Archive. Hello, hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Toronto Story Archive. So, what sport do you think of when you imagine a person getting straight wrecked? For those of you who don't speak millennial, that is tackled. Tackled very hard. Tackled into spraining your back, even. Because that's what happened to me. Only it wasn't football, American or, you know, real football, or rugby, or MMA. It was Quidditch. Yes, you heard me, Quidditch. Some say that you always learn who your friends are after you've left university. They're, they're the ones who stick around, who, who you invite to your wedding. But the fantastic thing about Quidditch and the Quidditch community is that even after I quote unquote retired, the, the people were still there. I mean, just last April, I was in Victoria, BC doing sports commentary for the Quidditch Canada National Championships. You might have heard about it. I was blasting it all over social media. Follow me on Instagram. But what is Quidditch? Those of you who aren't just hearing nerd, 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 nerd over and over again in your head must be wondering. Well, my co-commentator Siraj was the king of this elevator pitch, but I'll give it a go. Quidditch is a combination of rugby, dodgeball, and flag football. Four chasers run up the pitch carrying a slightly deflated volleyball, the quaffle. Their goal is to score it in one of the three hoops at either end of the pitch. Two players on either side wield red dodgeballs, the bludgers. When they hit someone with the bludgers, that player has to drop any ball they're holding and dismount their broom. Yes, there are brooms, or, or at least there is a piece of PVC piping that you hold between your legs, taking one hand out of the play and making Quidditch a one-handed sport. No, I mean, obviously it doesn't fly. What are you, nuts? Could you imagine the liability, especially for a sport that is full tackle, no pads? So the snitch. The snitch is a person, and that person has a golden tail hanging from their back. It's the job of the seekers to chase down that person, get around them, and snatch the tail, held on by only a strip of Velcro. This tail counts as the snitch and thus ends the game, granting that player's team an additional 30 points and usually, usually winning them the match. So a number of years back, a team was born and that team was Valhalla Quidditch. Valhalla was a controversial team, or I mean, at least as controversial as you can get with Quidditch. But because instead of being attached to a college or university, this was Canada's first community team, and it drew talent from players all around the GTA, and sometimes even beyond, much to the chagrin of those players' original teams. Like, it's pretty much an awesome sports vampire. I mean, if we're, if we're being colloquial about it. But, I mean, I was lucky enough to be chosen as one of those players, and so it was that I found myself traveling one summer a few years back to Myrtle Beach for the Quidditch World Cup. Now, Times have changed somewhat since my World Cup experience. The skill gap has, has narrowed. Back then, pit any American team versus almost any Canadian team and, and we lose. We absolutely lose. The Americans, especially on teams like Texas State and Texas A&M, had, had the size and they had the tenure. Quidditch has been around a lot longer in America than it has been in Canada. And it was in a game against the latter of them, Texas A&M, that I sprained my back. Now see, I play beater, which is cool because now when someone is running at me, I have a projectile. So assuming that you as a beater can aim through the terror of a, of a six foot something modern American freight train running at you, you can swallow your, your shriek of fear and hit them with the bludger, unseating them before they hit you. That is, unless their momentum carries them through the bludger into you pitching you like three feet across the pitch, which is apparently fine for them and the game, less so for you. But in my defense, I actually played out the rest of the day. I just, you know, couldn't walk for like a month when I got back. I had a cane. It was, it was great. It was great. There aren't a lot of pictures from that time. But since then, I have retired. Uh, I've retired now to tripping on the mic rather than tackling on the pitch. And the sport of Quidditch has evolved. 
Canadian Quidditch has grown significantly and today's guest has and continues to help it do that. This week, I have the pleasure of chatting with Yara Kodesha. Yara is an educational researcher, a youth facilitator, and the Director of Communications for Quidditch Canada. Coming at us from Church in Wellesley, welcome Yara. Hi Mo, thanks for having me. Uh, my pleasure, Yara. How are you doing today? Uh, I am enjoying the sudden shift to summer uh, that we are experiencing <laughs> here in Toronto. Uh, and oh man, it's true. Ignoring the fact that it was, I'm pretty sure, snowing yesterday. I, th I think that I wasn't mean, a I, super dream. Yeah, I was, I was on my way home and I got hit in the face with hail. I wasn't pleased. <laughs> so with that in mind, Yara, uh, what is one thing you love about Toronto? Uh, I would have to say how goddamn weird it is. <laughs> <laughs> to elaborate, I was born and raised in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, a respectable prairie city for all intents and purposes. I lived in the suburbs. I drove a Nissan to work every morning on a highway that has been under construction for the last like 30 years. Um, <laughs> and I feel the need to clarify before we proceed that I really am fond of Edmonton. I love its quirks and its character. And up until the moment that I moved to Toronto, I would have never described Edmonton as a normal city. Uh, but compared to Toronto, okay. Edmonton is as normal as it gets. Okay. Okay. So I mean, I mean, first, I am I am surprised that <laughs> you have cars in Edmonton. <laughs> I am I am surprised that there are roads in Edmonton. Although to be honest, I've never actually been in Edmonton. So so as you know, as Toronto is the center of the universe, I just I, I feel I gotta take my digs where I can get them. But but I feel you. Toronto is weird. I I personally came and I, and I mentioned it's like every episode so i'm sure somewhere along the line there is some some listener who's like oh my god he's saying that again but i come from north bay and it was a culture shock when i when i got here because i mean the city is weird it's so full of, of such a variety of people that that you, you cannot possibly go through the city and be like oh this is this is what i would usually see back in my hometown yeah absolutely i mean i moved from this suburban, you know, white picket fence neighborhood to a 28 floor apartment building overlooking the largest downtown sprawl of any Canadian city. Um, sometimes an elevator ride down to ground level is more interesting than an entire day <laughs> of, <laughs> that I would have otherwise experienced um, in Edmonton. You know, I'm a 15 minute walk from Dundas Square where at any time I'm guaranteed to find anywhere from one to four people dressed in a full Spider-Man costume. So <laughs> like weird, I think, is, a, is an apt description. I mean, that's so true, right? There, there are so many of those little quirks. Like there's, there's the dude in the Spider-Man costume. There's, there's Toronto Batman. I heard that dude was retiring, but yeah. I was walking into Dundas Square the other day with, with my fiance and, and you know, we were, we were walking through and there was this guy and he was just chucking fire. And it occurred to me that this is just the norm for me now. I, I glanced <laughs> at it and my fiance, my fiance is like, yeah, let's go take a look. And I was like, really? But we, we have, we have other places to go. No, that's when you know you've, uh, you're, as they, as they chant here, one of us. One of us. Exactly. Yeah. Um, um, for sure. And we haven't even, I mean, we're talking weird. We haven't even touched on Quidditch yet, which is, that's, if that doesn't paint a picture for you, I'm not sure anything else will. Um, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I got to the point that last time I went to North Bay, I, I definitely Googled North Bay Quidditch team. They don't have one. Well, they do. It doesn't seem to do anything, though. It was sad. See, Edmonton may not have had roads or cars for a long time, but we did have a Quidditch team. Uh, and and that, was, that was my reason for joining the Quidditch team in Toronto um, and becoming involved with the Quidditch community in Toronto. I had the briefest of uh, exposures to Quidditch um, out in the prairies. So what, what, is, what is Quidditch like out, out in the prairies? I mean, I mean we, were both, we were both at QC National 17. We, we, watched, we watched the Edmonton Aurors take it which was phenomenal. And, and I had a brief experience of playing Quidditch outside of, of, I guess, Ontario when I was in Calgary, but that's about it. So, so what, is, what is Quidditch like there? What's the community like? What's the sport like? Sure, yeah. So it's, it's 
a very different experience, or it was a very different experience when I was playing out there uh, compared to my experience here. And I'm sure that it's changed drastically um, in the last three years. Uh, for example, when I played Quidditch in Alberta, there was no way that there w- they would have had the capacity to win a national title. Um, th- there was just not enough bodies, not enough interest, not enough traction. Um, and, you know, unlike Ontario and Quebec, you have like a concentration of 20 teams all within a five-hour drive from each other. There were three Alberta teams when I lived there, <laughs> and only really two of them counted. Uh, so the the level of competition was just not as high, um, and it was a more casual uh, endeavor for people when I was playing out there. And then it wasn't until a really well known player from out east moved to Alberta and you know sort of took it upon himself to raise the bar of Quidditch in Alberta that the team became became uh, competitive. And that player, Chris Radiofsky, is is the coach that led them to their national title this year. Chris Radievsky, a.k.a., I mean, I heard word on the street that he's known as Batman on his team. <laughs> yes, the Edmonton Batman, one might say. <laughs> no, that that's really cool. And I guess part of what we're talking about right now is is the evolution of of sports in a relatively small location because here in Toronto we have access right we have access to to a number of different teams within within easy distance but i suppose once you get farther out where quidditch is not so so centralized almost in some cases so close to the to the american borders to our american cousins who have been playing a lot longer that it becomes more more challenging i mean wh- aside from the the fact that the population was smaller what are what are some of the challenges that you saw like trying to facilitate a sport outside outside where the greatest population of potential players were oh for sure well so first of all the the entry point for quidditch for the sport of quidditch for many people out west um was harry potter people were not coming to play this game because they were interested necessarily in uh getting tackled to the ground the 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 sometimes (laughs) icy and frozen ground um They were not, you know, initially there to develop an athletic skill set or or, um, play a really dynamic and interesting sport or game. That would come later. People were mostly there because they had heard about Quidditch at the Calgary Comic Expo or because, you know, the idea of playing the sport that was a part of their favorite fictional series was funny or amusing to them. Um, so that that was a change in, of mindset that um, was a challenge for a lot of people out there. Um, and then, you know, aside from that just, like, kind of mental shift that needed to happen, most of the practices that I went to only had seven or eight people show up at most. Um, oh, wow. The, yeah, it was, it was a struggle. I mean, and I think you explained the rules kind of uh, briefly at the beginning of this, of this segment, but you need – at least six people on each side in order to get like a good, <laughs> a good sense of the game going. So I think that made the game very abstract for people out there. It was difficult to mm-hmm. see what they were building towards and what, what the skills that they were developing would actually look like in a full, uh, in the full, you know, grand scheme of, of the, of the actual game. Uh, so it was difficult for them to visualize, uh, but I think Chris and, and the the you know handful of people out there that were really committed to seeing that game grow did an amazing job of getting all of this interest and traction uh, and media attention and community interest and collaboration and you know now they have a bunch of gold medals around their necks. She said not at all bitterly. <laughs> <laughs> Being one of the competitors that was. That was, uh, I, I was both uh, disappointed, but very proud of my hometown. For sure, for sure. But I mean, this shift you're talking about, it's its something that we're seeing everywhere. Like, I mean, I was never part of the Quidditch community back in back in the days of capes, right? Where people mm-hmm. a- actively wore capes while running around on brooms. I, I joined a little later. Um, but 
we're seeing this shift kind of cohesively throughout it where where I guess the way the the easiest way to put it is, is some of the whimsy or much of the whimsy has been lost in exchange for standardization of the sport and influx influx of highly highly competitive athletic individuals and a movement towards being more more of like an ultimate frisbee level alternative sport where it started out with with the whimsy with the you know not a real sport quote unquote and has now transformed into a sport that is he being considered for the Olympics. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, even there was a, a poll, I think, earlier, was it last year, uh, that Olympians responded to, Olympic athletes responded to. And, like, there is a, a familiarity of Quidditch among Olympic athletes right now. So there's definitely a change happening, which is cool and exciting to see. Um, I don't know if the whimsy of it will ever fully be gone, I mean, we do ride around with a stick between our legs. That is just the inescapable <laughs> truth of the sport. You will never escape all of the innuendos and jokes that come with that. Um, Fair. And it's, it's, it's kind of nice. I, I kind of think it's nice that it, that makes it almost impossible to take ourselves too seriously. Uh, I appreciate mm -hmm. the whimsiness of it. But I also enjoy that people are coming to this game with, you know, no familiarity of Harry Potter or any interest in becoming familiar with Harry Potter. They just see the game for what it is, the sport for what it is, um, and want to want to try it in its own right. Um, Alex Benepe, who was one of the founders of Quidditch, he always used to say, people, come for, come for the story, but stay for the game. Uh, that's how he used to describe mm -hmm. it. But now we're starting to see people come for the game and stay for the game, which is a cool uh, transition. It is a cool evolution because, I mean, we're seeing something that if you had talked about, about Quidditch like, like a number of years back, people would look at you like you're crazy. Yeah, buddy, you're going to go play some Quidditch, then you're going to go shoot some Defenders. That's that what's yes. up? <laughs> right? but, but, yes, but, that's right. That's how it's done. <laughs> exactly, right? But, but now, now you have people migrating to Quidditch from, from all sorts of sports, all sorts of athletic backgrounds, or, or some of them finding their own athletic feet within Quidditch itself. So, I mean, you, you work for Quidditch Canada, which is one of the, the national governing bodies for Quidditch. So can you give us an idea of what is the scope of Quidditch in the world today? I mean, like when I talk World Cup, it was, it was my team, Valhalla, uh, now also your team, but Valhalla, it was uh, the, a lot of the American teams, and then I think maybe like a team from the UK, a team from Australia. But what is the scope of Quidditch as it exists right now? Right. Yeah, it's it's a large one for sure, but it's also a scope with varying degrees of, you know, evolution and advancement. Like this shift that we're starting starting to see in North America and Canada and the USA, um people are, you know, less far along that journey in say South America, in Mexico, in um some of the smaller European countries where Quidditch is just starting to gain traction. Uh in part because in order for this sport to get any buy-in right now, uh, some of those countries rely on that connection to Harry Potter um, as, mm -hmm. you know, sort of a name recognition thing. Uh, so, so that attachment is, is necessary for these teams in, in smaller countries, these newer NGBs, to get um, funding, to get resources, to get any interest. Um, so the, it's, the scope is, is large and it's growing. Having the World Cup title move from uh, the USA to Australia last year at World Cup in Germany, I think was a really good thing mm -hmm. uh, for the growth of the sport. People are starting to recognize it not just as this thing that a bunch of Americans do, but something that kind <laughs> of belongs to everyone. Uh, so I think that was a, an interesting and exciting development of the sport at, uh, on the international stage. Um, but yeah, it's hard to say really where, where other countries stand in terms of the sports connection to its fictional roots, in terms of how much they want to see the sport grow to the point where, you know, maybe it does become an Olympic sport. Maybe it does become something <laughs> that is treated more competitively, um, in the sports community, um, or maybe, you know, they are still attached to that whimsical um, nature of it. It's, so it's, it's, it's really hard to say. But I think um, 
with the so we have an international governing body as well we have the international quidditch association the iqa and they're starting to uh, grow and develop and create some standardization across the world in terms of how the sport is played so i think as that organization grows and gains some legitimacy we'll see uh, a, a better set we'll have a better sense of where other countries and their national governing bodies stand and what they're prepared to do to help the sport grow and develop. Um, and, and then we'll see sort of where Quidditch takes us after that. For sure. I mean, I mean, it, it's in part branding, right? And you bring up an interesting point about the World Cup moving and how that changed the perception of Quidditch beyond something that just like a bunch of Americans do. Because I mean, like who really wants anything to be recognized as something a bunch of Americans <laughs> do? But, 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 you know, that aside, it, it's true. I mean, here, here's my question for you. As someone who is actively involved in the growth of Quidditch, and it's going to sound blunt, but let me qualify. Can Quidditch as a sport survive? And the reason I ask that is because, you know, for, for many sports teams to survive, they they sell apparel, they have sponsorships, they have corporate involvement, they do, they do player deals with different brands, right? But there is no way that the Warner Brothers uh, trademark on Quidditch as a term, right? Or, or their, their ownership of that word is so loose as to allow a sport to grow beyond like a certain rate limiting factor. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And uh, the stipulations that we as a Quidditch community have been given by Warner Bros and by uh, Rowling's uh, representatives in terms of how we use Quidditch uh, to grow the sport um, are, are pretty stringent in terms of what we're allowed to do for sponsorship, what we're allowed to do for fundraising, what we're allowed to do for merchandise sales. So uh, there, there is going to need to be a solution to that problem. But for the meantime, Warner Bros and the Quidditch community sort of have a, a relatively peaceful understanding. Warner Bros, I don't think, <laughs> fully understands um, the rate at which the, the sport is accelerating. So I think that that will come to a point, there, there will be a point where, you know, people will need to sit down and sort of decide what is going to happen with the sport. Um, it's impossible for any sport to grow without a uh, consistent sponsorship, big corporate sponsorship, right? Like that is how teams mm -hmm. and, and sports uh, live and breathe on the international stage. Um, we've all seen the Olympic cola commercials. We know, <laughs> For sure. we know that that single-handedly funds an entire airplane of athletes, right? So it's, it's going to be a conversation that needs to be had. But I think for the time being, um, Quidditch is sort of being treated by Warner Bros. as this fan activity. Um, they, they understand mm. that, you know, we're not out to tarnish the Quidditch name uh, and what Quidditch represents for people that are still very much attached to the Harry Potter series. Um, so uh, as long as we operate within those stipulations that they've provided us, I think uh, we can continue to progress slowly. But once uh, there is an active interest or once it's impossible to progress slowly and the only way to go forward is to, you know, careen at a high velocity towards an uncertain <laughs> future, that's when yeah. you're going to have to sit down and have that conversation. But I, I really wish I could tell you what that conversation would look like because I'm pretty curious myself. Like maybe, maybe the, the name will have to uh, mean something else. Maybe the, or the sport will have to take on a sort of different uh, uh, surface level identity. But I think the sport in its essence uh, will remain the same. I really hope that it stays the same. It's such an interesting dynamic sport, and uh, I've I've done things as an athlete playing the sport that I could never have imagined doing as a basketball player or as a track mm -hmm. uh, athlete. Uh, so I have high hopes for the future of Quidditch. I really do. See, I have to ask, right? Because because. I think that one of the things that, that I mean, Warner Bros might not recognize or, or many people don't recognize is, is the, sheer, the sheer scale of this sport. And it's, it's stunning to me still that it, it is not more recognized than it is because once you get to the point where you, you have multiple national governing bodies and, and an overarching international governing body and you're at the point where 
teams are fundraising to, to fly out players to a World Cup that's outside their country, right? It, it's surprising to me that people still don't take notice. Like, I was, I was going to a volleyball match uh, the other day, and... I come in and I'm I'm a little I'm a little late and they're like oh man you look you look really tired are you alright I'm like oh I just I flew in from BC and I landed at around one in the morning they're like oh what are you what are you doing there oh I was I was commentating Quidditch and I and I described the whole Nationals weekend and and they said to me well are you serious like is that is that a serious thing like you're really for real and I was like yeah I mean go on YouTube right. Go, go on go on YouTube and and look it up because because that's the thing people don't it, it's not as visible or it seems like it should be visible but I find that it's not as visible as it should be so let's let's boil this down to like a like a team's level let's take this to a team's level right you said we have what like 12 or so or 12 plus teams within this region of space alone yeah oh I would say more than that there are 32 teams in Canada uh, oh, wow. 32 operating teams in Canada right now. Yeah, more than we, they grow every year, which is um, obviously exciting to me <laughs> as a director of Quidditch Canada. Um, and I would say, I'm just trying to think, We there are seven west of Saskatchewan, so the rest of them would be out east. So over 20 teams, I would say, out east, which is pretty exciting. Um, and that's, of course, including development teams, including teams that are, um, that did not travel to compete at nationals, um, teams that are still growing their own community and their own base. Uh, but yeah, within Ontario, Quebec, and one of the maritime provinces, I'm not positive mm -hmm. about that. But yeah, between <laughs> those three sort of provinces, we've got over 20 teams in, in, in those areas. See, that's interesting, right? Because because when we're talking about nationals and some teams who didn't make it to nationals, I feel like Quidditch is on some level caught between a, a rock and a hard place because you you need the sponsorship and the ability to generate generate income in order to get a whole bunch of teams from, from one side of a country to another together in one place. But at the at the very same time, at, at the very same time, it's the fact that Quidditch is not taken as seriously as the as its population merits that, in a way, prevents many teams from getting the the grants and the funding and otherwise that they might need, or even the sponsorship from their own university. For for example, those housed at U of T or or Ryerson. So I, I guess my question for you is how how do you think that a growing sport can overcome? I mean, I hate to say the words the stigma of Harry Potter, but in a way, that's really that's really what it is. You say to like the f like fundraising at a university. Yeah, you know, I need to go play Quidditch in Victoria. Yeah, and they're absolutely. gonna look at when's what's the next o'clock on their on their schedule. So I've been doing a little bit of a, a social experiment on my on my own time. Uh, whenever I meet new people while I am marketing or playing uh, the sport playing the, the wonderful sport of Quidditch, I try to see how long I can go in the conversation without mentioning the word Quidditch. So they'll be like, oh, what are you doing here? And I'll be like, oh, we're playing this, this full contact mixed gender sport. It's a mix between rugby, dodgeball, mm -hmm. handball, and capture the flag. Uh, it's a very dynamic sport. It welcomes all body types, all genders. And they'll be like, oh, what's it called? And then that's when I just through clenched teeth go, it's called Quidditch. And then just yep. embrace myself for their reaction. Um, and sometimes I'm getting less and less that instant, like, oh, like Harry Potter response. People mm -hmm. are starting to, you know, the generational attachment to Harry Potter is going to come and go in waves. Um, but it's it's definitely lessening uh, with every passing year. So I don't even know if that name recognition is going to be as strong or as overpowering in like three years as it is now. Um, so you know, I guess we'll, we'll see. But in terms of um, overcoming the stigma of Harry Potter, I think it's striking a fine balance between recognizing that, you know, Harry Potter is where the roots of this sport come from. And, and to a certain extent, teams are going to have to embrace that and, you know, suffer through the same 10 second video <laughs> clip that comes between every news clip, every news clip of Quidditch, anytime, anytime it makes itself on the news, you see the exact same 15 seconds of Harry Potter and Draco Malfoy battling it out in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. 
And I swear, Mo, if I see that video clip one more time, <laughs> I may fling myself off a broom myself. So, uh, oh I my lord! We'll I'll be honest with you. I I have never I've I've never seen that. I I mean I I have fully embraced the the modern you know cable list no TV lifestyle. So everything is streamed. But I I have never seen that. I'm I'm absolutely gonna YouTube that commercial as soon as we're done on this call. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I'll send you some, some links because as the comms director, <laughs> I have access to, so, to so a bunch of them. You, you, you mentioned something there, which I think is, is it's interesting to touch on. And as sensitive as the topic might be, I do, I do want to talk about it a little bit. And that's the, just when you, you give your pitch about what Quidditch is to these strangers, that whole concept of, you know, it's, it's a co-ed mixed gender, gender sport. It accepts all, all body types, all genders, etc. And this is something that has been, I guess, controversial in athletics. Athletics is a broad mm -hmm. term in the past, right? Because historically, while, while co-ed teams have and do exist, you, you always see your divisions, right? Men's soccer, women's soccer, men's beach volleyball, women's beach volleyball, right? You, you see your divisions between the two. But what's interesting about Quidditch is Quidditch has always, from, from day one up till now, blurred that line completely and created a, a fully integrated sport that is absolutely up to date with the times, uh, socially and societally. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there are definitely... Uh, some challenges, and I understand the, the tendency for national governing bodies to uh, make sort of these binary gender distinctions, um, and, and that, that comes from a place of, of safety, particularly when it comes to full contact sports. Like, I know Rugby Ontario, for instance, you know, their, their uh, stance, their safety stance is that it is unsafe for um, uh, people of different genders to be playing the, the sport together at the same time, you know, for a myriad of reasons. So I understand mm -hmm. where that, where that um, rationale comes from. Um, but I think what we're seeing with Quidditch, what we're starting to see with Sports Canada in general, actually, is, is an understanding of, of the ways in which um, different sports abilities and different athletic abilities are in part informed by, you know, our biology, but are also heavily informed socially. Um, uh, the, the fact that I didn't play a full contact sport until I was 20 years old, uh, and I was never exposed to that when I was growing up as a kid, um, is, is, you know, in part due to the fact that, you know, women playing full contact sports is, is not a thing that people are used to seeing. So, uh, mm -hmm. Part of what I appreciate about what Quidditch does and what opportunities it opens up for people is is this idea that uh, there is space in these full contact sports, in these you know high impact athletic spaces for different people to come to the sport um, and learn the skills and do things with their body that they never would have been able to do before. Um, so. I, I, I don't know if controversial is the right word. Um, I think that people have been doing things the same way for a very long time, and it's, it's hard to envision a different way of doing it, um, particularly with, as I said, when, it's when it comes to a full contact sport, there are tons of safety concerns uh, that uh, mm -hmm. give Absolutely. people pause, understandably. Um, but, yeah, the, this this you know fully gender integrated shift that we're starting to see with um that we've seen uh forever with quidditch and that we're starting to see with organizations like ultimate canada um that we're even starting to see this debate happening in hockey uh so mm -hmm. these debates and these conversations are becoming more and more prevalent i don't know if i would credit quidditch for that but i think there definitely is a social <laughs> shift happening um, and it's kind of cool that Quidditch is at the helm of that um, in, in terms of its own policies. I mean, it is a societal shift, right? We, we have seen huge sweeping changes to, to social norms in recent history. And what I find so interesting is that, is that the definition of, of sport has changed. Because, you know, back when, I mean, I was in, let's say, high school or middle school or even earlier, you know, there were very specific lines on what constitutes uh, a sport and what position you play in the sport. Frisbee was a game you just, you know, 
it's a thing you tossed around outside at recess and it's a gym game when your gym teacher was too lazy to give you an actual thing to do, right? But now all of that has changed. Like the, the concept of athleticism has fundamentally shifted. And it's, I, I would, I mean, I would at least in part credit Quidditch for, for jumping on that very, very quickly. If, if not, you know, the, the foundation of this, then I would, I would put them as definitely an early adopter, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for myself, like I, so I was having these conversations with a lot of uh, traditional media outlets leading up to Quidditch Nationals. Uh, and I actually had one reporter ask me, uh, you know, for some people that would say Quidditch isn't really a sport, what would you, how would you respond to that? <laughs> and uh, I guess my, and my response to that and my response to, to other people who might be wondering like, oh, the sports of Quidditch? Um, is that if there, it's a game that in, involves some sort of physical and mental exertion, then it's a sport. Um, and the, the, the legitimacy of that is going to obviously vary with, with every uh, sport, sporting body, with every uh, mm -hmm. rule book, with every different style, with every different game. Um, but those are the broad terms that I operate with. And I think that Quidditch is as much, if not more, of a physical and mental challenge than, you know, your traditional run-of-the-mill hockey, soccer, football, basketball type sports as well. I mean, I don't know, Yara. I, I, those, those are some pretty broad terms for physical, like, mental exertion to create a sport. I was, I was playing a trivia game recently on Jackbox, which is a phenomenal Xbox game, would highly recommend. And, and one of the questions was, they, they named a university, and they said which alternative sport have they newly adopted into their into their you know athletic body and and oh, I'm the curious. answer oh the answer was video games the answer was video games not even like a specific video games not even like the Wii Fit not even a Zumba game right no, just <laughs> just general video games now let me tell you right i i love video games i am like you know halo right halo Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 2, hit me with that P90 and that 360 no scope, you know what I'm saying? But but like, okay, I don't I don't know that I've ever had, you know, crushed a full night of gaming with my friends and woken up the next day being like, man, that was that was a lot of exertion. I Yeah. Yeah. For sure, for Sports, sure. right? Yeah, it's definitely becoming a subjective category. I don't know <laughs> I don't know what the appropriate response is. If someone were to tell me video games were the were the new up and coming sport, I'm not sure how I would respond to that. Um, but I guess thank you for the heads up so that I can think of what my answer will be. Um, uh, I mean I would probably just stare at them blankly and then just turn and walk in a different direction. That might be best. Yes, I might uh, <laughs> pick up my cue from that response right there. Oh, I think Absolutely. I hear someone calling me. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's the one to do. You know, alert, alert. Oh, looks like my mom's calling me. I guess I'm going right, to have yes. to take a walk. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, y y you know... Jokes aside, it, it's interesting, right? It's interesting how the sport and sporting itself has evolved. And it's interesting how you have a very young community of people who have managed to effectively facilitate relationships at, at a, a local, national, and international level. I mean, Quidditch even has, I believe, its own, its own media on some level. And, and yeah. that's, that's, I believe, the, the Quidditch Post and the Eighth Man. And they have their own media. And that media is, again international but bringing this to i guess our our local our more local region of space i mean in, in america there is a good mix of of university based teams and community teams that interact in, in a in a somewhat if not towards very seamless fashion right they have their own leagues there but but for the most part they integrate well now valhalla was i believe the first community team in Toronto with with another one that started up a bit back and then fell apart and now a new one upcoming in Ottawa. So how do you how have the relationships been between, you know, Valhalla, which is my former team, your current team, a community team, and the the teams that are from universities that are housed somewhere with a U of T or a Ryerson? 
Right, yeah. So so Valhalla is not only the first community team in Toronto, but the first community team in Canada. It is Can- Canada's oldest community Quidditch team, and it's longest mm-hmm. running, uh, as you said, it's longest running uh, Quidditch community team. Uh, so it's going to be going into its fifth season. Is that right? I, or maybe it's fourth. I'm not sure, not to be actually. honest with you. Yeah, fourth, fourth <laughs> or fifth season, um, which is pretty exciting. And uh, as a community team, it faces its own set of challenges for sure. Uh, because, I mean, thankfully, out out east, there is that high concentration of teams. Uh, the GTA tends to be a place where people flock to. Uh, thank goodness for that. So uh, fortunately, Valhalla is never without uh, a healthy interest of people that want to join and continue playing after graduating university. So that is a large part of the reason that it has been sustainable uh, for so long is due to the fact that it's located in Toronto um, and and is in the center of this this you know large dynamic mm-hmm. networked Quidditch hub. Um, so that that is definitely a piece of it. Uh, the the challenges that Valhalla faces um, have a lot to do with the fact that there just isn't an infrastructure supporting the the team the way that a, a college team has. We don't have a guaranteed space. We don't have guaranteed funding. We don't have guaranteed anything pretty much other than a healthy interest mm-hmm. to play the game and then go drink afterwards. So um, <laughs> this is part of what I think keeps us sustainable also. Part of a complete sport, right? Yes, that's right. In fact, one of the first things I was told about Valhalla is that they were a, a drinking team with a Quidditch problem. <laughs> of course they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, you knowing Valhalla, it, it just it feels like the most accurate thing I've heard <laughs> about Valhalla. I mean, I mean, Valhalla has certainly evolved from when I was a part of it, right? Like back, back in the day, you couldn't get like three people out to a practice, much less a night out later, right? But, but now with the entire team going to nationals, very different story. Absolutely. And like even in the last, I've, this is only my second season playing for Valhalla, but in the last two years, we've just seen a shift in focus and discipline with this team that I have never seen in, in really any sport that I've played. Not that I haven't seen Absolutely. focus and discipline, but to see the change happen so quickly and uh, so dramatically um, was really exciting to me uh, as a player and a manager of that team. Um, so. I, you know, I hope that it continues into the next season because, it, you know, we're, we walked home with bronze medals this year. So, you know, let's go for gold <laughs> next year. Um, I mean, absolutely. They're, they're, they are a symptom of the evolution of the sport that, that we're seeing on a global scale. So, like, Yara, how did you get involved with Valhalla Quidditch to begin with? Uh, so when I was moving, when I was first moving to Toronto two years ago, I uh, got in touch with my, my former coach, Chris Radiofsky, and I told him I was moving to Toronto for grad school and I needed mm-hmm. a, a thing out there. He was familiar with, with the Eastern scene. I had never left home before. I'd never had a fresh start in my, at the time, 22 years of living, and I needed someone to get me an in. And he said, oh, well, Valhalla Quidditch is the place to go. You know, you're guaranteed to have mm-hmm. at least three things in common with anyone on that team. They're all a bunch of dorks and nerds. <laughs> you are a fairly big dork and nerd yourself. It, it should be fine. Uh, so he put me in touch with the former founder of the te- Well, the old founder, the former captain of the team. Uh, his name was Hugh. And uh, mm-hmm. Hugh and I messaged back and forth. Uh, as I was prepping to to move to Toronto for grad school, and he let me know that there was an open practice that would be happening the week that I moved uh, to Toronto. So uh, I went out to the practice. It was in Riverdale Park, uh, right off of Broadview. And Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how many of your listeners uh, are familiar with Riverdale Park, but I know you certainly are. (laughs) Oh, yes. I didn't have (laughs) the best sense (laughs) I didn't have the best sense of direction. I still don't. Uh, so I decided I was going to have to walk to this place because I did not trust myself to, to find my way if I went underground. Um, so I walked to uh, Riverdale Park and I stood at the top of that, that huge hill. Um, and mm-hmm. I saw the three Quidditch hoops 
that were being set up at the bottom of the hill. And I just felt this immediate sense of relief, like, oh, thank God I'm in the right place. <laughs> and then I hobbled my way down the hill, tried not to trip over, you know, all of the myriad of summer nonsense happening at the time. And I tentatively approach the scene and I wave and I say, hi, my name's Yara. And as soon as I introduce myself, I get the wind knocked out of me by the former um, uh, head manager. She's now the co-manager of the team. Uh, she comes rushing towards me. I literally fell on the mm -hmm. ground and she said, you're Yara. And uh, I tried <laughs> to <not> panic. <laughs> I was like, what yep. do these people know about me? Um, and that was Jess, Jesslyn, and she uh, introduced herself and she said, we've heard so much about you. And I was just trying not to say, that's nice. I don't know anything about you. Um, <laughs> and uh, and that was my sort of first um, thrust into the Quidditch world. Uh, the what My first thing that I noticed about everyone on Valhalla is that all of you are so tall, just like freakishly tall. It's really unnecessary. Um <laughs> For all five two of me, you were wearing uh, a Winter Soldier shirt, I think. Oh yes, I still have that shirt. I love that shirt. It's an excellent shirt. Uh, I think Devin, uh, one of the the captains on the team, was wearing his like Spider Man. Of course. Um, and then you know the average height of the people surrounding me was was like you know six feet, and then all five foot two of me is just looking up at this overlooming team. Being like, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> um, and so I called Chris from the field. I was feeling like a little nervous almost. I was like, these guys mm -hmm. are so tall and they're so intimidating. And I've only really played this sport for like three months. And I only think two of it, them counted. So what the hell am I doing here? Um, mm -hmm. And I called him from the field and I was like, Chris, what the hell am I doing here? Like these people, like. They are not my people. I, I don't think that we are going to gel at all. I was just so out of my realm. And he was like, Yara, just hit someone. <laughs> I was like, what? He's like, just get on the field. Just get on the field and hit someone. And I was like, okay, I'll do that for you, Chris. So I hang mm -hmm. up the phone. Uh, I get put into the first scrimmage. And I think I tried to hit someone, but got actually ended up being the one getting hit. Um, I forget who it was that hit me, but he, he like uh, clotheslined me. His arm just ended up running oh, into my neck did. as I was running towards him. And I fell flat on my back and, and like took a breath and then got up. And everyone started rushing towards me and being like, are you okay? Are you okay? And I just shook it off and was like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. And I later found out that that was the moment where I, I guess – you know, bought my bought my way into the team. That is the mark of a true Valhalla player. <laughs> take, it, take off the head, and go. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. Let's go again. That's the moment you became a Viking, right there. And that's the moment I became a Viking. Yes, that was my first my first draw of blood. <laughs> Chris Radievsky, that man, that man's a connector. You know, like when I I was traveling to see, uh, well, to go visit my then workplace, my then head office in Calgary. And Chris was the guy that I reached out to. And he was able to to connect me with the get the then Calvary Calgary Mudbloods, now now the Mavericks, I believe. And I mean it was great, right? And I think I think that's that's the fundamental truth about about Quidditch. Is that beyond a sport that is growing in intensity it is the people. It's the people that draw you in, the people that keep you there, and the community that, that keeps you connected and is, is very much on the cutting edge of social norms, which is, it's exciting. And it's exciting to see that from a sport that is only ramping up the intensity of its players. And I think that's, that's part of why, even though I may have, you know, quote unquote, retired from the community or from Quidditch as a sport a little while back, Retiring from the community isn't really something that you do because that that connection that connection lasts, you know. So Yara, I want to ask you the the second major question that we ask everyone who comes on Toronto Story Archive, and that is if you could recommend one place to go or one thing to do in Toronto. And I think I might know your answer, but what would that be? Oh, come and check out Valhalla Quidditch, of course. <laughs> At your first practice, uh, be sure to hit someone. That was that's my recommendation. 
That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Yara, for joining us on Toronto Story Archive. It has been a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks so much for having me, Mo. And that's a wrap for this week's episode of Toronto Story Archive. Each episode, we bring on guests from Toronto to tell us a story, any story, about their life in the city. Our commitment is to not sell, pitch, or bore you. Our goal is to amuse, excite, and at the end of the day, entertain you with stories told by the many voices Toronto has to offer. If you have a story to share, shoot me an email to submissions at torontostoryarchive.com. My name is Mo Waja, and thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Toronto Story Archive.